Hi, and welcome to the Professional Book Nerds podcast sponsored by Overdrive. Regular listeners will know that I'm a huge supporter of the romance genre and the notion that you should and can be able to read whatever you want without judgment. And for a long time, it felt like readers and myself included might have viewed romance books in a certain kind of way. But romance has really changed the game over the last several years, and as we'll discover from my conversation today, romance has always been at the forefront of publishing and readers. So I am thrilled to introduce this episode for everyone today. I had a conversation with Dominique Rocca. She is the entrepreneurial publisher and CEO of Sourcebooks, the company she founded from her home in 1987. Now, as a romance readers or readers in general, you may know that Sourcebooks has two phenomenal imprints, Bloom Books and Sourcebooks Casablanca, and both of which are inclusive publishers of romance. And according to industry statistics, Sourcebooks was the top of the romance category in 2023, they had a 228% growth in the Bloom and Casablanca imprints combined. As a result of that, Sourcebooks enters 2024 as the number one romance publisher in the United States. And I was fortunate enough not only to have the pleasure of chatting with Dominique, I was also able to chat with Paula, Mary, Molly, Deb, and Pamela, and they're part of the incredible team that bring all of these books to romance readers here in the U.S. So I hope you enjoy this peek behind the curtain conversation. We talk about trends in romance, a little bit behind the scenes of how the imprints work. They share their recommendations for books just in time for Valentine's Day. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Oh, and make sure you follow us. We're at Pro Book Nerds on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Send us a note to professionalbooknerds at overdrive.com. Happy reading. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Professional Book Nerds podcast. Emma here, and today's guest guests are very special. We have Dominique Rocca, who is the CEO and publisher of Sourcebooks. Welcome. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm so glad to have you here. I'm so excited. I've got a number of team members who are excited to talk to you about romance. I'm so thrilled. So we have a really a wonderful group of folks here from the Sourcebooks team as well. And as I mentioned to our listeners in the introduction to this episode, Sourcebooks is changing the game for romance. So you have your Bloom imprint and your Casablanca imprint. And so I would love to just start by asking about the approach to publishing romance under those two imprints. Oh, I love that. You know, what's really fascinating is, so so today, this is mind boggling to me, and I, I will simply tell you this. According to to uh, BookScan, we're the number one romance publisher in the country, which I find completely staggering. the 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 approaches that um, Bloom and Casa take are really different. So uh, Bloom is very much a quick to market strategy. So it's really meant for author entrepreneurs who really have have a lot a deep knowledge base. Of about their fans and how they they want to interact with those fans, Casas a little bit does things a little bit differently and creates um, builds authors from the ground up, and you can see that in in a lot of our um, our Casa authors, and also um, uh, has got a slightly different vibe. I mean, Casa actually goes into somewhat larger categories. Mary, I don't know how you think about this, but I, I see Casa going into somewhat more subcategories than Bloom sometimes does. 
Yeah, a Casablanca has a really um, large bench and also a really large kind of breadth to its approach to publishing. And like Dominique said, it is a bit, um, I wouldn't say like slow to market because we are a lot faster than um, some of our um, competitors and their publishers, but it is a very um, careful studied approach to each step of the publishing process and working with the author to kind of figure out what the best tempo for their fan, their books and their platform is. Um, so Casablanca is like very boutique and hands-on in that way. Well, the, th the thing that you're pointing to, Mary, that I think is really cool is that for both of our, the thing that has, I think, set source books apart is that our approach across both imprints. So this is, there are some things that the imprints share, right? Um, is that they are, and, and honestly, this is true of source books as a company, as a publishing firm. Um, we tend to be very author centric. So we we're author first. We really kind of spent a tremendous amount of time. I mean, I think you know this. We started in a bedroom and, you know, came out of nowhere. Um, and, you know, Publishers Weekly called us the most successful um, self-made publisher uh, of the century. So so we're we really come from nothing. We're a startup, right? So um, but that really has to do with working with each author based on where they're trying to go, what they're trying to do. So, you know, so if you talk to Mary, she'll, you know, she can tell you about what Katie's trying to do. And if you talk to uh, Krista, she can tell you, uh, she can tell you, um, Krista can tell you, you know, what, what she's trying to do. And obviously Deb Worksman's here and she can tell you what Lucy Score is trying to do when a you know, a number one New York Times bestselling romance author. So so each of our authors have a game plan and a thought process and an approach that they that they um that they want and and we work closely with them to create that success. I think that's fantastic. And as a romance reader and someone who sort of devours everything that you put out through Bloom and Casablanca, I really see that with the way that you present the titles to readers and the way that you put the authors first and sort of work with them. I love the sort of cohesion between all of the social media profiles of like authors I follow and then the romance, the Bloom Instagram and the Casa Instagram. I love seeing all of those things sort of overlap. Um, there's sort of certainly no shortage of romance, you know, for voracious readers to find here. Now, you talked about this a little bit already about sort of what each imprint looks for and specializes in. But is there something that makes a Bloom title a Bloom title and a Casa title a Casa title beyond sort of what we've talked about already? You know what? There actually there are a number of things. One of the things that um, that and Pam can speak to this, um, and and by the way, so can Mary. But one of the things that we're really doing is um, is working with each author to think about their strategy, their go to market strategy, and how they how they particularly want um, to be working. One of the things that's deeply different about source books, and I would say. Um, is a huge competitive advantage for us is we have not one, not two, but five different marketing teams working on our books. And I think in today's environment, which is very cluttered, right? I mean, there's a, a tremendous, I'm sure you're experiencing this, just a tremendous amount of books being published, right? No shortage of books, right? So it becomes really important to think about the different levers that you can pull. And we have uh, an, a panoply, a real um, breadth of levers and different authors pull different levers. And, and you can see that Bloom authors tend to pull certain levers more and Casa or authors tend to pull, pull some other ones. But, um, but Mary and Pam, please chime in. I think um, it's very true. A Bloom author, like Dom said before, is fast to market. A lot of Bloom authors we actually find via reader trends and what's hot with readers um, versus Casa is longer growth. But I would say that Mary has done a very interesting 
and comprehensive job on the CASA list in making it one of the most diverse and inclusive imprints in the industry. And I think Mary would have a lot to say about that. So Bloom, tons, tons and tons of blockbusters and the you know, the authors that three to 400 to 500 to 800 people come out to see at events. Um, but there's definitely something very special and newsy happening at CASA at well, as well. But there's a lot of diversity as, uh, as well on the, uh, on the um, Bloom list, right? So yeah. one of the, let me say it a different way, because I, I think this is really important. I, I am experiencing the world, and this is just me talking, I am experiencing a world in which there has been, because of romance, um, and an expansion in readership, and a more diverse readership, and a younger readership, and I, I think, I think what we're seeing is an extraordinary time in publishing. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mary. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that is all very true and very important, and kind of leans into what both Casa and Bloom, their major strength is, and Sourcebook's major strength, is that um, it, it takes pride in being a bit of a rule breaker, and. Um, I've been in romance industry. I've been in publishing for over 20 years. And the rules of romance have been kind of the rules of the road. Everyone's had them kind of ingrained in them. And then I come to source books and it was immediately like, okay, you can Kool-Aid man your way through these walls. They don't exist. In fact, we take joy in doing that and say like, oh, Walmart or whoever, like whatever the supposed rule is, isn't interested in a uh, polyamorous romance, high heat, uh, with all queer leads. Why? Why is that a rule? Why does that exist? No, it doesn't. We're going to publish that book and we're going to publish it proudly. And we're going to put our full effort and love behind it. And um, that is like baked into our ethos. Um, it's like, I know I'm kind of off-roading from the difference between Casa and Bloom because we both have that, but I would say like the the Bloom is like very like fan-led in that direction and Casa Blanca is listening to the fans, but it's also kind of the editorial vision, like helping that author vision um, grow into that aspect. So it's blooming, but at a slightly uh, different pace. I think that's fantastic and such a great point that each sort of has their areas of expertise or specialization, but that really, it does come down to what Sourcebooks is doing as a publisher that's sort of pioneering um, all of these things. Now, romance is having a moment, uh, as we've seen, uh, you guys have made the news, you know, as the number one romance publisher, according to the industry statistics, with just the exponential growth you've had for Bloom and Casablanca in prints combined in 2023. What do you think has contributed to the success of the romance genre, particularly over the last few years? I'm going to say this again. I, I think during, so I have a hypothesis, but I, I don't have a lot of great data on this. And my hypothesis is that during the pandemic, people turned to reading quite a bit more, um, particularly as, as um, as and and that we do have data around, right? As there was a strike and and you know and that compounded with the pandemic, so streaming became you know became uh, less available. What I think we're seeing though, and I've said this to my team, if you think about young adults, so we are a leading publisher in YA. If you think about young adult, there are no boundaries really in young adult. Like it isn't like young adult is, oh, here is your young adult romance versus your young adult dystopian versus your young adult mystery. A, a YA book can have all three of those elements and be published, you know, and, and actually look to you like a fantasy and it'll have all of that in it, right? What's what When that reader grew up, they actually started looking for no, much fewer boundaries. They walked into bookstores that had sections that separated all these things. But all of a sudden, they were free to express a love for lots of different kinds of books. And I think that's what you're seeing in Romance Today. I think Romance Today actually represents that reader, that voracious reader. And that is so incredibly exciting. 
I agree. And I think what's really great as well is sort of that the general attitude towards romance seems to maybe be shifting. There was that sort of stigma, you know, about romance readers with their covers of shirtless men and like sort of reading it in secret. And and it wasn't necessarily looked to as a, a genre that everyone was clamoring to read. But we know that romance has been, you know, one of the most popular genres Forever. 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 <laughs> exactly. Emma, I mean, seriously, the foundation of our lives yeah. is our love, yes. right? Like it is an absolutely foundational part of our lives. We would, having it represented in all of its glory and all of the wonderful ways that it can be represented. Yes, this is me saying, you bet. Exactly. And so it is really nice, obviously, as a romance reader myself, to see that the attitude towards it is is hopefully shifting and that the respect for romance novels is there because we know that romance stories can tell so much more about life than perhaps people gave them credit for in the past. And so what I would love to know from this group of sort of experts is where you think the genre might be headed. Do we think it's just going to continue to expand, gain new readers? I think and hope so, but I'd love to hear from you. Can I just mention that the romance readership <clears throat> and romance authorship has been on the cutting edge of every change in publishing for the last, what, four decades? You know, they uh, romance readers drove the ebook revolution. Romance readers drove self-publishing. And romance readers had a lot to do with the audiobook, downloadable audiobooks um, revolution, right? So, I mean, I think... Emma, you're right that there's been a real stigma associated with romance, but it's just, you know, it's so, I mean, but there's, there. I mean, in all honesty, this is me saying I lead a woman, you know, led team and there's stigma associated with a lot of things that have to do with women, right? And maybe we should get past that. Maybe we should just kind of just get past that. Exactly. I think we should definitely support everyone reading what they want to read. And that includes lots of romance, in my opinion. <laughs> and so for this group as well, there have been a lot of trends in romance. Dominique, as you said, the readers sort of are turning to romance now because it can encompass several different you know, genres. It can include fantasy. It can have contemporary. It can be historical. It could be a combination of all of those things as we're seeing with some of these authors pioneering that. What trends are you all seeing in romance? And are there any trends you'd love to see more of as well? Well, look, I, I mean, you'd have to be under a rock to not notice romanticy, right? Like you, you, romanticy is here and, and it's incredible and it's in so many different ways. The other thing, I mean, I think I'm sure you're seeing, Emma, is dark romance also here. I, I want to just make a plug for dark romance, which is, I, I, which is so surprising because I, I'm not usually the person who does this, right? So, um, but the authors who are writing these books are extraordinary, and they're writing these books from a place, and and I think a number of us can talk to this, from a place of real knowledge and real experience. And it is absolutely a privilege to be their publisher. So um, so I would say that. I would say also small town, high heat is Lucy score all the way, right? Like it's absolutely there. Um, sports also, I think, um, whether it be hockey or soccer or rugby, right? Um, if you haven't read Chloe Walsh, honestly, I have like I feel like I could spend my life reading. I know, I know, like Mary's laughing at me, but I uh, but Chloe Walsh, it's just an extraordinary experience to read Chloe Walsh because it's it's the haves and the have nots, and it's a rugby um uh you know, Irish rugby. I mean, it's, it's a world you don't know. And at the same time, an extraordinary amount of pain and healing and found family and all the 
all the all the uh, experiences that you want. The other big romance trend that I think my friend Pam can speak to is in-person events. Before we go to that, I just wanted to say another um, trend is the fairy tale retellings, which I find so amazing because people are flocking to these books. They take the characters that we grew up with, where the women were supposed to be pretty and waiting around to be saved by men. And they're taking these women and they're making them the heroines and they're the ones who are tough and they're making their own destiny. And it's just resonating with readers in such an amazing way. It's a huge way, Paula. You're totally right. Yeah. If you haven't read Jesse Hastings, Never, which is a retelling of Peter Pan in a way that this is Pan as you've never seen Pan, Hook, and Wendy. Um, and then there's, you know, of course, Emily McIntyre, who we all dearly love. And, you know, and and of course, lest we forget the, you know, the Greek retellings that are taking place under, for example, Katie Robert and, and Neon Gods, um, which is, and of course, the extraordinary Scarlet St. Clair, who has a touch of chaos coming out in March, which may be the biggest pre-order book that we have seen out of the romance category that could be true. I, um, so Scarlet's a Touch of Chaos coming out now. So yeah, thank you, Paula, for adding that. Sorry. No, I think that's fantastic. And it's funny. I actually went to my local bookstore to try and get the Chloe Walsh, like first few books, Binding 13, and I'm, it was completely sold out. There was like a sad little staff recommendation section and all the books were gone. <laughs> um, so I have to tell you, Emma, I have spent like weekends reading Chloe Walsh because it's so extraordinarily immersive. You lose yourself in there. And um, and we should mention that Chloe's being published in YA in young adults. So this is Bloom YA. Um, and I think that's the other thing that we're seeing is that this expansion of of uh, of YA into a uh, into a lot of places. So yeah. Yeah, I think that that's true as well. I mean, as a a reader, I started reading YA as a teen and have sort of continued well into my 30s um, and sort of finding the different areas where the YA resonates with sort of all readers, but then certainly for the teen readers with which they're written for. I do love that they're sort of just, again, we've talked about this, no shortage of options that you can certainly find what you're after with books. And I do want to just shout out to this team as well, because the Dark Olympus series by Katie Robert is one of my most recommended series on this podcast. I talk about every time she has a new book in that series, I was like, it's on our monthly picks. We're recommending it. Emma, it is one of my go-tos. <laughs> Emma, just so you know. Mary Altman, who is here on the podcast, is Katie's editor. Like, I have questions about the series then for you, but that might go down a totally different rabbit hole um, of that. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely sidebar at any time because I am never tired of talking about uh, Katie Robert, Dark Olympus, Wicked Villains, which just came under source books. Everything that they do is bonkers in the best way. Uh, and that's like what drew me to Katie's books in the first place was when they pitched it to me. I was like, this is weird and I love it. And I know that other people are going to love this. And I think that that's a really wonderful approach to take because I know that that's not necessarily the way that other publishers may have approached books, but it's, I, I love Katie. I follow her on all social media. And so anytime I see like another book coming out or whatever else is next in a different series, her ideas are always so incredible. It's like, well, why aren't we, why haven't we been publishing this kind of stuff already? And so it's nice to see that diversity of content and of storylines and of characters just sort of be more embraced by publishing and particularly by the job that you are all doing at Sourcebooks. So thank you I, as a reader. <laughs> I've been very lucky in the last year or two. Um, Sourcebooks lets me go on tour with some of our bigger authors if they're going to have larger scale events. And going with Katie for the last two tours has been eye-opening because whereas a lot of our authors are drawing these giant crowds, if you look at Katie's crowds, it's different. It's different than um, other authors might be. There's 
you know, every persuasion there, such youth, families coming, people crying, pink hair, teal hair, men, women. I mean, it's just an amazing group. Um, you know, I love these pictures. So Pam takes pictures uh, um, of Katie's crowds and um, the pictures are extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, it's just the fact is that that Katie's crowds are enormous and you know, and just uh, they're so they they all love these books so much. And I think that's a really excellent point, though, that all of these authors and these books bring so many different people together and sort of have that common passion and love for these characters and these stories. I literally just uh, spoke to our local library here in Cleveland, Cuyahoga County Public Library, because I screamed when I saw the Elsie Silver event coming to town in a few months um, just to try and like, you know, toss my hat in the ring to chat with Elsie. But um, it's incredible to see, you know, be amongst other readers who love these characters, love these stories, and then get the chance to interact with these authors who have created these characters in these worlds that mean so much to us. I think I often turn to reading for sort of a, an escape and a distraction, especially when life is busy and stressful as the last few years have been. And so it is really nice just to sort of be able to engage with people that feel similarly excited, you know, about cowboys and stuff in Chestnut Springs. So. I know. <laughs> isn't it? I mean, isn't Elsie incredible? Yeah. She just made the U. I, am I correct? I, she just made the USA Today list. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to tell you, and she also just made the Globe and Mail list and she's Canadian. So the Globe and Mail list is like a big deal for her. So I'm so excited about that. Um, and I love all the, I've, I devoured her books too. They're incredible. Um, it, and it's always nice to see. So like I go to the bookstore a lot, which I don't need to do because I have too many books, as you can see behind me. Um, but it is always incredible to just see like full displays of books. And it's like all Bloom, all Casa, and all of these titles that we know and love from Scarlett and Katie and so many other folks. We can't stop the podcast. We cannot do this podcast without mentioning, of course, number one New York Times bestselling Anna Wong. I mean, we have to talk about Anna because Anna, she has a new book coming out. And it's coming out in, I think, uh, Pam, help me, Molly, help me. I think it's coming out um, in September. Is that right? I heard, I heard, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you should know we are so, so, so excited about Stryker. And, um, and obviously Anna's books have just completely resonated with people. Twisted Love continues to be on the New York Times list and has been there for weeks and weeks and weeks. And Anna clearly has um, uh, has resonated with, with romance readers. She really has. And that's a good, her books actually remind me of a question I have for, for you all is that what I think you do well as in addition to many of the things we've talked about is embracing the special editions or sort of new covers or making books really special for readers to have. And so I don't know if anyone here could speak to sort of the approach to that. Paula's team does all that. Well, she doesn't make the manufacturing part of it, but she's the one there. That, that's the team bringing that to us. Paula. Yes. So we, um, you know, we're, we're very much moving forward with special editions. In fact, Mary just launched her spring season to sales yesterday. And I loved that she, um, every book she was asking or telling us that we were going to get stained edges and special, um, special um, enhancements to the books. Um, so yes, our customers definitely are looking for something unique to offer to their customer. And Sourcebooks has been very generous in, um, you know, working with us so that we can have different editions for different customers. Anna Wong um, will have special editions at Target as well as Barnes and Noble. Um, and um, we're constantly looking to give the fans what they want. I think Mary could speak a little more to like all of the great, um, you know, things that she's putting into her upcoming books um, because it really is um an amazing amount of additional material. 
Yeah, uh, our philosophy is really that this is coming from the way that the fandom reader um, kind of reads and engages with their the books on like archive of our own. You're reading a fan fiction. There can be embedded art. There can be playlists. There can be like you can have literal music playing that connects to what the story is doing. And books historically have felt more static. And that's really not the way that especially this romance reader is reading. They are used to that fandom experience where it's a full 360. So we're taking that approach with our books and we're having art inside of it. We um, actually have one that I'm working on right now where we're encouraging readers to actually color within, like we're doing stained glass style art. We're encouraging people to color within their books to really like live in these books, kind of have a full experience of them. Um, and I think like that is really the way that book reading in general is going because people want to interact with the things that they love. So why should books remain untouchable and static? Like, why are they different? And I love that you're pointing to the extraordinary connection that that this set of authors has with their readers. And you see that in events. So this, I, I was showing you, this was an event that um, we just did for Katie and Midnight Ruin at Joseph Beth. I don't know if you can see that, that packed room. I mean, that's just a packed room for Katie, right? Yeah, that's incredible. And I, again, it's just a full of smiling faces and happy people that are so excited to talk about her latest book. I, and this is to this team, my plug to please always send all of these authors to Cleveland, Ohio, so that I can go to all of the events um, because they're always, you know, um, I know that the, there are a lot of other places that you can send the authors, but there's always a packed crowd at Cuyahoga County Public Library. <laughs> Cuyahoga and Max, um, Max Bax does a really nice job with getting books at the events and getting, you know, people to go home with stacks and stacks of new authors to explore. Exactly. Now, I do want to ask this group about, uh, you know, book recommendations. We have thrown out some authors and titles that you're excited about, but I would love to ask, you know, in time for Valentine's Day and sort of February, where we're celebrating romance all month long, if there are any books, I narrow it to one or two, uh, a piece. If there's anything that is either recently released that you want to share or that's coming soon that you think our listeners just absolutely have to devour. I've been pitching as my number one Valentine's Day pick because it comes out right next week, um, Waiting for the Flood by Alexis Hall. It is part of the Spire series and it is the most beautiful and lyrical story. It's relaxing. It's like a cup of tea, you know, very... Um, it's just, it is so beautifully told. I and think of course, Alexis Paul, the author of Boyfriend Material, which would, would have been one of my recommendations. So thank oh. you, Pam. It's, it's wonderful. I think I probably overlap with Mary on this one. Yeah, definitely. Anything Alexis. Um, also, uh, Girls with Bad Reputations by Zio Axelrod just came out. And her books are just a full experience. And they're so cool. And they're so emotional. And you just dive into the worlds that she creates. Um, also in that vein, Lily Chu, uh, the comeback. Uh, she's just such a smart, with it approach to romance and um, deep, deep layers and deep meaning in all of her books. But they're packaged in such a fun, vibrant way that they're so enjoyable. Could I recommend Alice Kellen's duology, All That We Never were and all that we are together, which is absolutely gorgeous as a a, a, a group. And it's a new adult um, following with an age gap story and following a young woman who's an artist and just absolutely compelling reading, very, all the feels, all the feels. And if you would like to um, have your heart broken, I would, which I, in all the best ways, I strongly recommend A Thousand Boy Kisses by Tilly Cole, um, who, which has, which really, which it has got a new book coming towards the end of the year. Um, but I have to tell you, um, we'll, 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 you'll spend time thinking about it. 
And I would recommend Hopeless by Elsie Silver. I know we spoke of Elsie Silver a couple of times, but oh, you have it. That's awesome. I have all of my favorites sitting right here. So I'm glad to know that there's some of your favorites as well. That's so great. Yeah, I think, you know, those, she is building book over book and um, she is going to be a huge star um, bigger I than totally she agree. now. And um, also Lucy scores um, Worst Best Man. Um but then also, I'd love to plug one more if I could, because I am in sales. Um, Lucy Score has a series that we are um, publishing, um, Riley Thorne, and um, it is a lot of fun. It's the Janet Ivanovich for a new generation, for a younger generation, um, but it's got romance, it's got adventure. Um, the first book is um, The Dead Guy Next Door, um, and it's coming in um, a few months. We would be neglectful not to mention that people should start reading Hades and Persephone series by Scarlet in anticipation of A Touch of Chaos coming out in just, I think, a short month. So, yeah. so you, want touch of, you want to be reading A Touch of Darkness. You want to be reading. I mean, it's just it's Scarlet. I mean, it's just kind of amazing. You read my mind. That's what I was saying. We're kicking off rereads in February to get ready for Touch of Chaos coming March 12th. So the book that started it all, Touch of Darkness. And if you are rereading, you're going to find a whole bunch of other people online to chat with who are reading rereading it as well. Oh, can I also mention Sarah Kate's Salacious Players Club? Oh. Because it is taking the world by storm. And, and it is so sexy. I mean, it is really, really sexy. Um, amazing. Yeah, there's no shortage of recommendations. I know our listeners will absolutely devour all of these suggestions from this group. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts on romance, everything that Sourcebooks is doing as a publisher. And again, provide our listeners with some insight into the industry. And again, just a heap ton of recommendations for Valentine's Day and sort of February, the month of love. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com, and our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen podcasts, visit evergreenpodcast.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.